And yeah, I guess today's topic, we're going to be talking about um, studying um, upright bass as an electric bass player. And this is because we were enjoying checking out Francois's performance of a Ray Baron track. So Francois plays electric and upright. He's been an academy member for a long time. Yeah, Francois, and right? he's done a lot of work hey, on, his, on his upright playing. And you can check out the thread to get some inspiration straight away. Um, we'll link below. It's called Study Pieces on Upright Bass. Um, and the one that he does where he's covering a Ray Brown tune is just absolutely superb. So we just thought today we'd maybe just, you know, chat about this a little bit. Studying as, upright players yeah, as, an, as an electric player. bass player. Even if you don't, this is important, even if you don't play upright. Yeah. I think that's the key thing. And and um, I think in my past, like something I talk about all the time is that as a vehicle of learning an instrument mm. um, and, and really getting to grips with how to get fluent around the neck in terms of harmony, you mm. know, using scales and arpeggios, jazz is an amazing vehicle for yeah, that, right? Absolutely. And, and I really sort of like stand I'm, I'm like hard and say, you know, if you really want to nail the fingerboard um, in a really, you know, really fluid, really great way in terms of moving through your scales and arpeggios and being able to use them in context, I'm not talking about just sitting there and playing a two octave C major scale for no mm. reason at all. Actually mm. using this stuff, right? I think you need to give yourself a vehicle in which you're going to use that stuff. It's not, you know, yeah, you can, you know, learn a two octave major scale, but what are you going to use it for? Mm. And I think learning how to use that stuff, jazz is a really great uh, vehicle to do that. So in terms of if people aren't into jazz, that's cool, you know, but it's you're missing out on a huge opportunity in terms of learning your instrument. And I think a lot of most pro, pro, pro bass players. Right? Mm. I'm not talking about people in famous bands. I'm talking about freelancers that are Se- making session players, if you like. session players yeah. you know. like Very you, Yeah, music. you talk about the sort of like the daddies that are, that are nailing that on them in a, in a big way. You know, all of them will have, yeah. have studied jazz. You know, all of them, you know. Will have James studied. Jameson, you know, uh, Nathan East, just something like course, random. Of course, know. yeah. Like mm. right up to... Um, I, I can't think of anybody that wouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Absolutely. You know, like Pino Palladino, uh, you know, all of these guys that are sort of like common household names in the bass playing community, all of them will have studied jazz. Like, they might not be jazz players. I mm. think that's my point. They might not be jazz players, but they've absolutely, you know, seen the benefit from studying jazz standards and because there's nothing better to to really get you to learn the fingerboard and, and mm. learn how to use functional harmony on the on the fretboard. And what you end up with is obviously when you're studying this stuff, you're looking for other players to study because that's how if you wanted to be a great funk bass player, you're going to be studying the great funk bass players. You're going to be studying Larry Graham. You're going to be studying yeah. Marcus Miller. You're going to be studying Bootsy Collins. You're going to be studying Flea. You know, mm. that's how you learn yeah. by studying the great guys. And, and if you do uh, think to yourself, okay, so like, you know, I understand that jazz is going to be a really great vehicle for me to use. Uh, to learn this, uh, to, to apply this stuff that I'm learning, arpeggios and chord tones and scales and stuff like that, and improvisation. Um, ultimately, you're going to end up wanting to study some people that are really great at playing jazz and the lion's share of them guys that are really, you know, uh, publicly visible are the upright guys, mm. you know. So for me... Well, they defined the language because electric yeah. bass wasn't around when that was happening. That's the key thing. It's not saying that like upright bass is better in jazz than electric bass or anything like that. It's just that when people like Oscar Pettiford and Ray Brown, you know, okay, with Ray Brown, electric was kicking around as well. But the predominant thing that the lines that were shaped, that really those classic, like all those that triplet fill stuff... You, that makes so much sense on upright. All those yeah. cool kind of triplet drops that people Ray Brown plays. It's a good goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're so comfortable to play on upright. They're really dictated by the, the physics of the you know the, the physicality of the instrument. Um, and I don't think you would have ended up with a sound like that if it had all started out on bass guitar. I think it would be. Yeah, you know, it'd be really cool, but it would be different. And I think learning those those fills, going to people like Ray Brown and, and looking at the way that he walks, will really impact your note choice and the way that you play. I play jazz differently, uh, and I walk differently on electric to the way I do on upright. Um, much more, m- like much more open strings on an upright. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I think that a lot of the language that you learn has, uh, has come from that. And it means that now when I do play electric, I also incorporate a lot of those fills, those upright kind of fills. But yeah. I, I got them from playing upright. And if you think about guys, we mentioned James Jameson earlier, who also plays, uh, played, played upright, played upright yeah. as well. 
And the way that he used his right hand, it, it, there was a lot of there was a lot of kind of drop motions where you know like trick the drop type stuff, you yeah. know, a raking going on. There's a lot of stuff that kind of feels to me very upright based in its uh, you know. Well, Jameson used a ton of open strings as well. Yeah. You yeah, know, in the most peculiar oh, yeah. we were talking about yeah. yesterday. Harmonically, it's yeah. really unusual places. In usual places where he'd, instead of playing a chromatic run, say like E flat down to D flat, right? Yeah. Da, da, da. He'd play like E flat, open D, then the D yeah. flat. So he'd play on the A string, the, the, the E flat on the seventh fret, play six, sixth fret, boom, open D, and then the D flat. So instead of just going da, 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 he'd be do, da, do, you know, and do it like that. So, and that's directly from the upright, isn't it? Yeah, and I think your hand, if your hand shape is different, you're using different, um, you have to shift differently, there's no frets, there's all sorts of limitations and, you know, and things that, you know, not just limitations, things that, are, that make it easier to play particular lines and others that are sort of, uh, you know, fit in that upright sound. Yeah. And taking as much of that language and trans- translating it onto the electric bass is such a powerful thing. I mean, we mentioned Flea just briefly. I read an interview with Flea where the, they talk really in passing about him having an upright bass and a real book on a music stand next to it. Yeah. And like, you know, there's so many people that just like, you know, get so much from it. And it's such an unusual instrument as well because it's acoustic. I think that has an effect in, in terms of drawing sound. Uh, playing fretless and playing without frets is really important. Yeah, yeah. Who, who are some of your favourite upright players, Scott? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some of my favourite upright players and then let's discuss exactly what people can get from studying upright. I'll go on How about okay, that. So okay, just to give on. it a bit more structure, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... My favourite, the, the upright players that I listened to hmm. um, when I was transcribing, and ultimately that's what I'm saying, like I was working out their lines. Hmm. I wasn't just listening to them, you know, I was like sitting there and, and working it out. And sometimes hmm. it's tough because of the audio of the recordings was so old. Yeah, that's that, hard. You know, it gets a little bit lost in the mix sometimes. So head fo- using headphones is preferable hmm. uh, on a lot of this. But uh, my main upright guys were... Um, John Patitucci. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. John Patitucci. And do you think that he plays differently on electric because of upright? There's yeah. something going on there, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think you can... Sorry, I'm into it too, but go on. Yeah, yeah no, 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 he absolutely. He just, he just he plays his electric. And Christian McBride? Right, yeah. So, John Patitucci, Christian McBride, uh, Eddie Gomez, mm. uh, Scott LaFaro. The way Eddie Gomez plays is so unique. Like, you yeah. know, I'm picking that language up and getting it onto it. And oh, actually, of course, Scott LaFaro as well. Yeah. It's so different. Mark Johnson. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Just while we're talking about all the Bill Evans mm. bass players, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, who else? I mean, Steve Swallow. It had that background. In, he had that background. So Steve upright. Swallow plays electric, acoustic electric bass. Um, but he had an upright... Uh, he started out on upright. I'm trying to think. Obviously, like Ray Brown, mm. but not so much for me. Like Ron Carter, mm. not so much. Mm. Yeah, you know, like great player, but I d- yeah. just didn't really transcribe a lot of his lines. Yeah, me too. I totally agree with that. Um, um, Niels Osted Pedersen. If yeah. anybody wants to check out <laughs> the craziest upright yeah. bass player, Niels Osted Pedersen. I mean, he um, was doing that three finger thing. Way before, you know, like Matt Gow, you know, in the right hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his fluidity and the speed that he plays at is truly, like, mind-blowing. You know, watching the old videos of Nils Henning, Austin Pedersen, is just amazing. It's well worth checking out. Yeah, um, he, he really, when he was really, really young, um, he released a, a vinyl of him playing all the Parker, oh, all the Parker tunes, solo, yeah. on his own, where he played the head, yeah. up to speed, if not faster, <laughs> than yeah. Parker did it, you know, and then solo ran it. All, you know, I don't know if you can, it might be on YouTube or something like that, kicking around, but it's really great vinyl. But he, uh, a friend of mine used to play um, in a big band with, with yeah. Nils, and, uh, and he said, and he said, you know, we had a few bass players, you mm. know, that sort mm. of like rotated in that big band, mm. right? And, uh, and he said, when Niels was playing, he said it was like, literally like a freight train was behind you. Yeah, <laughs> he yeah. Said it was just- he said it was so powerful you felt like you were going to get pushed off the stage and nice. he said it was insane yeah yeah so I absolutely loved that story um, I'm trying to think of anybody else that's Brian really Brian Bromberg you introduced me to Wood Brian Bromberg Wood yeah check out Brian Brom- Bromberg's album Wood it's a solo which, double bass album as an yeah. unaccompanied well is it all actually, I think I it actually know. might be I don't know there's a lot of unaccompanied double bass and it's incredible like, yeah what about you well, I mean, the one guy that you didn't mention that we both dig a lot is Renald Garcia Fons. 
And then of course, I mean, he's like, this. oh, I love him, but I, yeah. I wasn't transcribing it back in but, the day. Oh, yeah. in terms of what the base players who who's, who've lines you've stolen, uh, John Clayton Jr., um, Christian McBride, Ray Brown. Um, there they go. Uh, John Palatucci. Can you get Jimmy Garrison? Uh, not as, if I'm honest, not as, not as much. Paul Chambers. Paul Chambers, absolutely. It, it, yeah. Because if you're transcribing albums like Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, really classic lines, you know, um, absolutely. Um, who are the other people? I just thought someone who I forgot there that you would um, definitely agree with. Oh, there's just there's just so many people that are so inspiring. Oh, Larry Grenadier. You oh, know, Larry Grenadier and the like Brad modern, Meldau trio. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then there are people that we know, people like Zoltan Decaney, you know, yeah, yeah. who are truly, like, inspiring. And the way that he plays, Zoltan plays electric. I can sort of... It's different because of his upright training. Charlie Hayden? Charlie Hayden, of course, yeah. And, I mean, you, you can just learn so much about musicianship from listening to the, the careful notes. Yeah. I mean, like, like, some of these I haven't really... Like, a yeah. few of the key guys that I said I really transcribed a lot of, like... I Charlie really... Hayden I've transcribed. Not so much Mingus, but, I mean, why not? Yeah, I mean, the stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've stolen yeah. a few of his licks, that's for sure. Yeah, and, yeah. And his yeah. compositions are absolutely incredible. Um, so why should people be studying? Well, crime? I think... I'll tell you what I think it is. I think it's because, like you were saying earlier, that you are learning this classic language that was in existence... Essentially, before upright bass playing came along, but came along electric bass and it's, playing, sorry, electric yeah. playing, and it's dictated by the sort of physics of the instrument and the tradition and this lineage, which is which is different, and you won't naturally tend to play like that on electric bass. So you can trans transpose or you know bring all of these lines onto your electric bass playing and learn language that doesn't naturally fit under the fingers. Yeah, you know, yeah. that doesn't naturally come that way, and it's also the classic language that we all you know are so familiar with. Um, yeah. And you can bring all that across. And in the same way that you can with electric, but on upright as well, you can switch this back. You can switch it back and forth, and you can, yeah. There are people like um, Adam Ben Ezra, who you interviewed recently, who are taking all sorts of techniques from different places, uh, yeah. you know, and it's uh, and mixing them all up. But I just think it's such a rich... You can go and practice, like, you could learn loads of Miles Davis trumpet solos. That would be great. But double bass is so obviously connected to the electric. It's so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and yet at the same time, the language is so is really quite different at points, you know, the way you move on the instrument. And I think it will give you a better, a better understanding of the way of, well, of new ways that you can play the instrument. Yeah. What I used to do, if anybody's figuring out how they can actually get into this, mm. I used to take jazz standards. Yeah. Let's say all the things you are. Yeah. And then I'd try and find the great upright bass players playing that. Yeah. So I'd get all the things you are on, you know, on a sheet of paper back yeah. in the day, you know, now it'd be on your iPad, on your, desktop or whatever yeah. if you're looking for lead sheets by the way just go to write the name of the actual tune let's say all the things you are lead sheet just go to google images click on the oh. on the images yeah. and loads of images of the lead sheet will come up so get that and then get on youtube or get wherever you listen to your music yeah. and find one of these great upright bass players playing that tune and then just start transcribing it. okay so and like just do it four bars at a time so Okay, so he's starting there, and then look at his sheet. Okay, so he's playing like a root there. Oh, and mm. then he's playing another root to a minor third. So you're understanding, you're deconstructing what these guys are playing and figuring out what they're doing over that particular information. Super important, okay? There's no point learning all these lines if you don't know what they're actually you know, using it, the framework they're using, harmonically speaking. So learn their lines. And then as you're learning their lines, be looking at the lead sheet, so all the things you are, or so what, or whatever, you know, tune that you're listening to, and figure out what those guys are playing, what language they're using over that particular tune and the particular harmonic context that's going on at that time. Mm. I think it's really, really important. Um, and also with solos as well, look out for, you know, the solos, then again, get the lead sheet and figure out when it says F minor, what's that guy playing? When it says B flat minor, what's that guy playing? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. over two five ones, what are they mm -hmm. doing all that time? So it's just a really, really key thing to do. And somebody that's done um, a great, when you were just going back to what you were talking about then, somebody that um, did a great piece where he, he imitated an upright mm -hmm. on electric bass, you've got to check this track out, mm -hmm. is Victor Bailey. Okay, fantastic bass player, one of my favourite bass players, going through a, a terrible, terrible yeah, time yeah, right yeah. now. So yeah. everybody send Victor a lot of love, okay, because he, he really needs it. Um, but Victor Bailey, on his album Low Blow, did a track called Baby Talk. Baby Talk, okay. You'd be able to check it out on, you know, YouTube or something like that. 
Um, check out the bass tone on that. Check out the bass solo. He That's does good. this fantastic bass solo. Mm. It's on the electric bass. It's on a Penza Sir, I think, um, or a Sir or a Penza. Mm. <laughs> they split up. It's on a jazz style instrument, right? Jazz bass style instrument. Um, and he does this solo and he's, and he's phrasing and everything. Oh, let, let's just check it out. Let's just play it. I'll get the, I'll get the solo, solo one. Solo. Okay. We can maybe get d to put this in over the top. Oh yeah. What we'll do is we'll drop it in over the top so yeah. you can check it out. Okay, so as you can hear from that, he's really going for that upright tone. And what a great, he just absolutely, knows. it's not just, it's not the upright tone. And he does play with his, he actually his right hand right over the, around the 15th fret. But it's the phrasing that's really important. It's the, mm. he's like plays these legato lines that are just so upright-esque. Mm. And uh, yeah, so, and huge love to Victor as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so... Rounding that up, up, you know, make sure that you are listening to and studying upright bass players if you are getting into, you know, studying jazz standards, which hopefully you are, because it's a really, really great learning tool. And, uh, and you, you'll be able to get a lot from it. Two thousand and fifteen Kickstarter challenge. Hey everybody. Hey. Hey everybody. Hi everybody. Hello all. Hello.